Hi everyone. Hello. My name is Barnaby. Uh, I'm pastor for the English ministry at Spring Fountain Church in San Bruno. And uh, I'm also the Bay Area director for a Christian club ministry called Decision Point. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I was invited by Pastor Kim uh, for some mutual context. Um, so I just met him for the first time like 15 minutes ago, but uh, I'm always uh, excited and encouraged to be a part of God's family worshiping uh, on the Lord's Day. So thank you all for being here. Um, just a great time of, of praise together. I love that last song talking about the atonement. And it's going to have uh, a lot of relevance to what we're going to look at today in the passage. So I don't know if you have your Bibles. I think we do have it on the screen here. But the passage for today is from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. And I don't know if you guys do this, but I like to ask people to stand as we read God's word in reverence. So can we all rise together? I'll read for us. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 15. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There are two men in a certain city the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew up with him and with his children. He used, he used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there was a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or her to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the men who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah, and if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Amen. Would you be seated? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this day. Lord, we're reminded as we gather in your name that we are your people, that we are your children, that we have been born again in Christ through his blood and his resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells in each of our hearts as believers. And we pray, God, as we sit under the teaching of your word today, that your spirit will come alive in us and that you will allow us to see and to hear your voice. Lord, we pray that you would speak loudly into our hearts, that you would renew our minds, that you would convict us of our sin and refocus our attention to the cross. Lord, we thank you for the great grace by which you have loved us and you have shown us mercy. And we pray that we would go forth from this place and from this community out into the world in the power of Jesus' love. In his name we pray. Amen. 
little bit about me before uh, I start talking about hypocrisy, which I know is everyone's favorite topic. Um, I am a pastor's kid. I grew up in the church. Um, around middle school, I started to really stray down the wrong path. And I started to hang out with the wrong kids. And uh, by the time I was in high school, I was living a full-on double life. You know, I was, I was doing drugs and, and doing all kinds of stuff with my friends at school and then at church on Sundays and Wednesdays and Fridays, right? As you're a pastor's kid, you know, I was, I was the church boy, you know, doing praise team, um, knowing all the answers in Bible study, going on mission trips, and all this stuff. And I didn't become a Christian until I was 20 years old. And at 20 years old, I was a, I was a student at San Francisco State University. And uh, once I finally became a Christian, I realized that this wasn't something that I could keep to myself. That, that evangelism or sharing the good news of Jesus was not meant to be something that's just for advanced Christians, but it's meant for all Christians. So even in college, and I was a philosophy major, so I would argue with people all the time about the truth of the Bible and the gospel. Sometimes I would have conversations right in the hallway after school for hours with people who disagreed with what the Bible says about abortion, what the Bible says about sexual morality, what the Bible says about creation. And all of this was very invigorating for me because I've always had a rebellious heart and I love getting into arguments with people. But there was something common that I would, I would hear a lot from everyone that I would talk to about Christianity and about the gospel. And if people were willing to give Jesus a shot, they would, they would say something like, yeah, I like Jesus. Jesus is great. But I don't, like, I don't like the church. I don't like Christians. And I would ask why, and they would say, well, because Christians are hypocrites. And typically, it would be these same people that would say, the reason they don't go to church is because Christians are hypocrites. And I think most of us here, I mean, I'm assuming most of us are Christians, as much as we might not want to admit it, I think we have to admit that uh, there's a lot of truth to this statement. That a lot of Christians are, are hypocrites, and there's a lot of hypocrisy among the church. But what is hypocrisy, right? I think, I think hypocrisy is easily defined by saying that you're going to judge other people on a standard that's higher than you judge yourself. And if that's the definition of hypocrisy, I think it's fair to say that everybody's a hypocrite. I think it's fair to say that, yeah, you might find hypocrisy in the church, but if you go to a mosque, you'll find hypocrisy there. If you go to a Buddhist temple, you'll find hypocrisy there. If you go to an atheist gathering, you're going to find hypocrisy there. If you look throughout history, all the evils of the world are paired with hypocrisy, including evils committed in the name of Jesus by the church, sadly. I don't know if you guys are aware, but this past week we lost a great hero of faith, Tim Keller. And Tim Keller had a profound impact on my life, primarily through his book, The Reason for God. And he wrote this book for people who were trying to understand why there's a reason to believe in God in the first place. And in this book, he has this passage. He says, many people try to understand Christians along a spectrum of nominalism at one end and a fanaticism on the other. A nominal Christian is someone who is Christian in name only, who does not practice it and perhaps barely believes it. A fanatic is someone who is thought to over-believe and over-practice Christianity. In this schematic, the best kind of Christian would be someone in the middle. Someone who doesn't go all the way with it, who believes it, but is not 
not too devoted to it. The problem with this approach is that it assumes that the Christian faith is basically a form of moral improvement. And it's not. Now maybe as I talk about a nominal Christian, you're, you're, you're identifying yourself there. You're like, yeah, I'm here at church. I go through the motions. I kind of believe in God. I think there's such thing as right and wrong. Jesus probably died on the cross. I'm figuring it out. Maybe you're in that boat. Or maybe you're in the fanatical boat, right? Where you're just like, this is the only thing that matters. I want to tell everyone about this to the point where I'm losing friends. Nobody wants to be around me because they always feel judged and criticized by me. Or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. The point is that this is not an accurate representation of Christianity. That in fact, whether you're a nominal Christian or a fanatic Christian, both are hypocritical Christians. Today we're looking at this passage. It's a heavy passage. It's about King David's greatest failure. Up till this point, it seems like King David was an awesome guy. All right, a man after God's own heart. But this was at David's lowest point where he killed another man's wife, another man to take his wife as his own, and then he gets her pregnant. It sounds like something out of 2023, right? And Nathan is a prophet of God. And Nathan comes and he confronts David, but notice he doesn't confront David directly. He tells him a parable. He tells him a story. It's a hypothetical story. But when David hears this story, he doesn't realize that it's about him. He just thinks of a rich man taking advantage of a poor man, lacking mercy and being greedy, taking the one limb of this poor man for his own gain. And it's only when Nathan points out, you are the man that David is convicted of his sin. See, David is displaying textbook hypocrisy in this passage because he's holding this hypothetical rich man to a standard that he didn't keep himself. The question we're asking today in the title of my sermon is how should we respond to hypocrisy? How should we respond to hypocrisy? And I know, when you hear that question, I think Probably your mind is going towards how do we respond to hypocrites, like other people? But the reason the question is not how do we respond to hypocrites and rather it's hypocrisy is because we need to respond to our own hypocrisy as well. In fact, we need to respond to our own hypocrisy first. The, the central idea of today's text is that we should respond to hypocrisy with humility to God's word. That's how we need to respond to hypocrisy. That's the example we see in scripture today that when we are confronted with hypocrisy, whether it's our own or whether it's others, we need to respond to it with humility to God's word. And the sermon in a sentence for you to take away is that you must examine yourself, remember the cross, and pursue the love of Christ. You must examine yourself, remember the cross, and pursue the love of Christ. And it's only when we do these three things that we can elevate above the common sin of hypocrisy. First, I want us to note that sin blinds us from our own hypocrisy. That's what we see in David. He's blind to his own hypocrisy because of his sin. In fact, because of his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, he's trying to cover it up. And that's why he murders Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. It's really wicked what David did. It's, it's so bad. You know, every now and then, um, you know, when I'm on retreat or I'm with my team, you know, for icebreakers, we'll ask the question, like, oh, who's your favorite character in the Bible? And I love it when someone says, David. Because then I jokingly say, oh, you like adulterous murderers. 
Great. Of course, I'm kidding. That's not all David is known for. But if we were to apply cancel culture to the characters in the Bible, man, David doesn't really deserve a spot. Right? I mean, he's real bad. He's probably worse than everyone in this room. I, I don't think any of us have, you know, murdered anyone and taken another man's wife. I hope not. But David, in trying to cover up his own sin, what he does is he covers up his own eyes. He doesn't realize how hypocritical he is. Even when he's told this story by the prophet Nathan, he doesn't have the sense to realize that Nathan's talking about him. It's only when he says in plain words, you are the man, does he finally realize, oh, this is me. See, this is, you know, above all else, sin is a blindness. Sin is a blindness. And when we sin and we don't repent, when we sin and then we respond with hypocrisy, we are even more blind than before. We're all prone to hypocrisy. Why? Because we're sinners. We're all prone to hypocrisy because we're sinners. And because we are sinners, it's always easier, it's always easier to identify the sin in someone else's life than your own. Right? It's always easier to do that. That's why cancel culture is a thing. That's why we all have opinions on what's happening with celebrities. We all have opinions on what government leaders should be doing. We all have opinions about famous people. Why? Because their lives are public. We can examine it. But let's be honest. If we examine our own lives with the own standards, that we examine others, would we be guilty or innocent? I want to share with you an example that I think you'll probably remember. It was just a couple years, a few years ago in 2020, you know, when this little thing called COVID happened. You know, masks were mandatory. I don't know what your church was doing, but our church wasn't allowed to meet in person. We had to go on Zoom. Not only that, social gatherings were discouraged. Public schools were closed. And people were even fined and arrested for violating social distancing guidelines, including churches who felt convicted to stay open. And in the midst of that, in California, we find out that our leader, Gavin Newsom, has kids who are learning in private school in person. We find out he's attending birthday parties at the French Laundry. If you don't know what the French Laundry is, it's, it's like the best restaurant in the United States. We find out that his kids are not only going to school in person, but they get to participate in basketball camps. And in the photos, we see that nobody is wearing a mask. And Gavin Newsom goes to these football games where masks are mandatory for all attendees, and you see him there sitting there without a mask. I don't know if you remember it, but I remember it. The cries, you hypocrite. You see, conservatives had a field day with the Adam Newsom, but it was the liberals too. They were upset. Why? You're the governor. You're the one that's signing all these laws, telling people what they can't do, and then you're applying different laws to yourself. This was a textbook example of hypocrisy. The, the former mayor of San Diego said this, his kids can learn in person, but yours can't. He can celebrate birthday parties, but you can't. He can dine on a $350 meal at one of the fanciest restaurants during the worst recession in this generation, but you definitely can't. Can you believe it? I can't. This reminds us of Jesus' famous words from Matthew 7. He says, judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye, 
but do not notice the law that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First, take out the log of your own eye, and you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Sin blinds us from our hypocrisy. And Jesus himself says, you have a log in your own eye. And all you want to do is point out the speck in other people's eye. He's not just describing people like King David or Gavin Newsom. He's describing you and me. He's describing our natural condition, born as sinners. Is that in our blindness, we convince ourselves that we can see clearly enough to judge others. And he says in verse 5, clearly, you hypocrite. Did you know that the word hypocrite is used 18 times in the Bible? And that all 18 times it comes from the mouth of Jesus? And all 18 times it comes from the mouth of Jesus, he's talking to religious people. He's not talking to the tax collector and the prostitutes. He's talking to those that identify as people of God. The first thing we must do in response to hypocrisy is to take the log out of our own eye. We must take the log out of our own eye. Yes, Gavin Newsom is a hypocrite. Yes, King David's a hypocrite. But so are you, and so am I. We are all prone to the same sin, but the tough part is that we're blinded to the sin to see our own hypocrisy. Another example, you know, we live in the age of smartphones. Everyone has a video camera in their, in their, in their pocket, right, or in their bag. Anytime you see something happening, why don't you take out their phone and start video, video recording, right? If you see an old lady getting robbed on the street, you're not going to help her, you're going to record it, right? If you see someone getting bullied at school, you're not going to help them. You're going to record it, right? This is such a good illustration for us because you know why? Those smartphones come with two cameras. There's one on the front and there's one on the back. And in those moments, what is the camera that is facing you seeing? Are you entertained by the wickedness that's happening in front of you? We don't need to point fingers anymore, we just point our cameras. What we need to acknowledge as we talk about hypocrisy is that we're not, we are not just spectators and victims of sin in this world. We are not spectators and victims of sin, we are also perpetrators. We are all guilty. And we need to flip that camera and judge ourselves before judging others. But how do we do that? How do you judge yourself when you're blind? If you're not able to see clearly, how are you going to see yourself clearly? Even if you look in a mirror, if, you're, if there's a log in your eye, how are you going to see? Well, the thing is, the answer is not to just look to yourself. The answer doesn't come from you. You're not your own solution. The answer comes from God. The same way David wasn't his own solution, to this issue, the answer came from the Word of God through the prophet Nathan. So for us, the answer is going to come from the Word of God that reveals and convicts us. In verse 7, Nathan says to David, you are the man. And then he says, thus says the Lord. And he exposes and he lays out his sin. You are the man. Can you imagine being David? You know, this is the point in David's life when he had pretty much risen to his highest point. He had been running for his life for most of his young adult years from Saul who was trying to kill him. Finally, he becomes king of Judah and then he becomes king of Israel. He's starting to conquer neighboring nations. He's at his highest of highs. And he's probably sitting on his throne talking to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan says to the most powerful man in Israel, maybe the most powerful man in the Middle East at that time, he says, you are the man. You have sinned against the Lord. How many of us would want to be in David's shoes at this point? Not me. Here's the thing about God that we learned from this passage. God cares so much 
that He will not leave us alone in our sin. God cares about us so much that He doesn't just see us commit all kinds of sins towards Him and towards one another and towards ourselves, and He's not just like, eh, they're a lost cause. They're not going to listen anyways. No, He cares. And especially as His children, we are disciplined by our good Father. He cares for David, which is why He sends the prophet Nathan. You know, when you read this story, it doesn't sound like God is loving David, but really, when you look deeper, you see that God didn't need to send Nathan. God didn't need to reveal David of his sin. God was not obligated to do that. Why did God send the prophet Nathan to David to convict him of his sin? Because he cares about David. Even though David has sinned, a very grievous sin against the Lord. God still cared for David. You know, none of us want to be in David's shoes when the, when the Word of God is pointing at us and saying, you are that man. But that's where we need to be. That's part of us experiencing the love of God. Because God cares about us, He doesn't leave us in our sin. The Bible tells us that He disciplines those that He loves. You see, God didn't send the prophet Nathan to David the same way He sent prophets to other nations, warning them of their destruction. God sent Nathan to David so that David could be restored to him. God was giving David the opportunity to repent and to be restored. The same way in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover up their own sin with leaves. But God comes into the garden and He says, where are you? What have you done? God's not dumb. He knows. He knew exactly what happened. You see, here in this story that sounds like such a harsh story of condemnation, it's actually a story of grace. It's a story of God giving an opportunity for redemption. No one wants to be on the receiving end of this kind of message. Like, that's just not natural for us. We don't, nobody's like, yeah, I want, I want to be convicted of my sin all the time. Like, I just want to, I just want to become so aware of how terrible I am. Like, nobody just desires that. But God knows. He knows how much we need at every time. You know, this wasn't the first time David sinned. That's another important thing to know. This wasn't like the first sin that David ever committed. David was committing a lot of sins, and God didn't correct him at every single time. But at this point, God comes in and corrects him. See, God knows what we need, when we need it, and how we need it. And just as David needed Nathan, the prophet, as a messenger of God, to deliver God's word to him, we too need God's word to reveal our hearts to ourselves. You don't know your heart. The Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can understand it? It's desperately sick. I don't know if you're like me, but when I feel sick, when I have like, I don't know, I have this, I have this like bump on my back. It's kind of weird. I joke that it's my cancer, and I, I really don't think it is. But I remember my wife would say, Babe, you gotta go to the hospital and get a check now. I said, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. No, it's nothing. It doesn't hurt. Even when you touch it, it doesn't hurt. So it's, it's probably nothing. And that's how we that's how we think about our own sin. We're just like, oh, I mean, you know, we don't need to go to the Father who knows. We don't need to go to the scriptures. We don't need to go to our brothers and sisters and our pastor at church. It'll just figure itself out. I'm fine. That's your heart talking. That's not the truth. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13 tells us the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You cannot understand your own heart without the Word of God. You cannot understand your own heart without the Word of God. 
The world, and especially Disney, every movie, it's about following your heart. Don't do that. That will kill you. Follow the word and find what's really in your heart. And you will see that what's really in your heart is not worth following. Because our hearts are desperately sick. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed in the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Sin blinds us from our own hypocrisy, but the word of God reveals and convicts. And hear me when I say this, without the word of God revealing our hearts and convicting us of our sin, there is no hope for us for redemption. How can we be redeemed? How can we be sanctified? How can we be washed? Unless the Word of God is doing that work. We're not doing it ourselves. Sin blinds us from this. And what we need to realize is that the Word of God is the agent that cleans up our vision. Our vision to see ourselves first and not just others. You might be sitting there thinking like, that's part me, I'm not a hypocrite. Like, I'm not like you. I'm not like judging people all the time. Which honestly, I'll be honest, like that's something that I, that I struggle with. That's something that, I, that, that I'm working through. I know that that's the way God needs to humble me. But let me tell you this. Just because you don't say anything, it doesn't mean you're not judging people. It's like this, when you go to L.A. and you see terrible drivers, they honk, they yell. In the Bay, when you see terrible drivers, they just silently judge them from their car. But you know what? The judgment is the same. And Jesus tells us that it's not only our actions that are condemnable, but it's the thoughts that we entertain in our minds. He says, if you call your brother fool, it's like you're murdering him. If you look at him with lust, it's like you're having adultery with her. What about our condemnation of others? 1 John 2, 4 to 6 says, Whoever says, I know him, talking about Jesus, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You see, as in the church, it's so easy to judge one another. It's so easy to judge other churches. It's so easy to judge Christians who make you uncomfortable. I see it all the time. Every church has people who just complain about what the church isn't doing, but they're not doing anything. Every church has people who are really active and trying to make sure their criticism is heard. But in these situations, we must know that the standard is Christ. The standard is not your opinions on what you think other Christians should be doing or what you should be doing. The standard is Christ. And if the standard is Christ, then we all fall short. That even though we're saved, even though we're adopted into God's family permanently, that we're still going to keep messing up. So if the standard is Christ and we all fall short, then we need to have grace towards one another. I heard this saying that all Christians want to have a great pastor, but few want to be great Christians. Say it one more time. All Christians want to have a great pastor, but how many of us really want to be great Christians? How many of us are just like, oh, I'm saved, I'm forgiven of my sin, I'm good, leave me alone. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me I need to read my Bible every day. Don't tell me I need to worship. Don't tell me I, sh I need to go on mission. Don't tell me I need to talk to people about Jesus. I'm already going to heaven, I'm fine. That's hypocrisy. Because you're saying the pastor, the leaders, Maybe my parents. That's the standard they need to live on, but not me. I make my own standards, like Gavin Newsom, or like King David. You see, hypocrisy is not always aggressive. A lot of times it's passive. And we need to be careful of both. 
But what is the cure? I talked about how we can see clearly. We need the word of God in order to see our hypocrisy for what it is. But what is the cure? The cure is only the grace of God. Only the grace of God can free us from a cycle of hypocrisy. You know what's the cycle I'm talking about? It's one of uh, example, say there's two Christians, right? And one Christian says, hey, um, you're, you're sinning. You're in a bad relationship. You're, you're an abusive husband. Like, that's not right. You gotta fix that. And then the other Christian's gonna say, well, who are you to judge me? Are you, are you a perfect husband? Are you, are you a perfect Christian? Are you like Jesus 100%? Don't be a hypocrite. Don't judge me. So what does this person have to say now? Well, you're being a hypocrite. You're saying don't judge me, but you're judging me. And this is the, the cycle of foolishness that oftentimes happens in conversations with Christians. What is the cure to free ourselves from the cycle? It's the grace of God. Now, if you look at David's story, in verse 10 it says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. There's a curse. There's a consequence. The sword will never depart from your house. Verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David had accumulated many wives and concubines at this point, and part of the curse is that someone else is going to sleep with all your wives and concubines in public. And here's where we see David in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. And if there's one thing David did right in this passage, it's this in verse 13. He doesn't defend himself. He's not giving excuses. He doesn't order Nathan to be arrested and killed, which was very common for kings to do when prophets said things that they didn't want to hear. But he humbles himself to the word of God. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And if you really want to know David's heart, go read Psalm 50, 51 or 52. Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. I don't want us to miss this. When David heard the story of this hypothetical rich man, what was his conclusion? That man must be put to death. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, judge not, for you will be judged by the same standard you judge others. David knew that the sin of the greedy man in the hypothetical story deserved death. So he understands now that he deserves death, but this is where we see the grace of God in Nathan. You have utterly, uh, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. And that in itself, that in itself is the grace of God. Verse 14, nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Now, as we read this part of the story, it's easy for us to sympathize with David and say, wow, this is really harsh. This is a really hard punishment. And if you know anything about the rest of 2 Samuel, it's basically the consequences of this passage actually being fulfilled. David's older son, Amnon, rapes David's daughter, Tamar. Then Absalom, Tamar's brother, kills Amnon. Then Absalom tries to take over his dad's throne, and David has to run away. And the one, the man who sleeps with all of David's wives is his own son, Absalom. And he does so publicly from the palace. Like, this is like Game of Thrones stuff. And it seems like, wow, this was so harsh. Not only that, but the child the innocent child who didn't do anything that was conceived by David's adulterous relationship with Bathsheba dies. Sounds very harsh. But there's another lesson here about sin is that sin is always far more destructive 
than we think it is. Sin is always far more destructive than you think it is. We always underestimate the gravity of our sin. You know, when the stuff of Gavin Newsom blew up, the French laundry news, Newsom came out and said to Californians, I made a mistake. Sounds like David. I want to apologize to you because I need to preach and practice, not just preach and not practice. Sounds, you know, sounds like he acknowledges his, his faults, but then he says something after that. He says, we're all human and we all fall short sometimes. And I don't know about you, but if the first part didn't make me upset, the second part did, because I was like, man, you're saying you want grace. You're saying you expect grace from Californians for your hypocrisy. But you're not going to show that grace to others when they violate these laws. To me, that communicated that although he acknowledged his hypocrisy, he still wanted to be treated with a different standard. But we see in David's story, God doesn't treat David with a different standard because he's king. God is just. He will not tolerate hypocrisy, adultery, murder, and injustice. But at the same time, God is merciful and gracious. He forgives David of his sin on the spot. Did you notice that? That when David confessed his sin to Nathan, Nathan didn't say, let me talk to God, I'll come back. I'll let you know if you're forgiven or not. He doesn't. So what, what we can assume is that God already told Nathan, if David repents, tell him I forgive. He was able to give an immediate response to his immediate repentance, and he spares his life, yet he punishes David for his sin. He still has to deal with the consequences, at least some of them, see, there's forgiveness and there's atonement. Forgiveness is a restoration of relationship. Atonement is payment for your crimes. Okay, so they're not the same thing. We can't expect both of them to happen. There are two things that God does for us. In David's case, there's some level of atonement. Who pays the price? instead of David for his own life. His innocent son. His innocent son is killed because of his sin. His life is spared and this baby is killed. That sounds so cruel. But God would have been justified to wipe out the entire family and no one would have any case against God. But in Christ, we see that Christ didn't just forgive us of our sins, but he atoned for it on the cross. Have you ever wondered that? If God wanted to forgive us so badly, why didn't he just send a letter that says, I forgive you? Why did he send his only begotten son, Jesus? Because God understands true justice. True justice is not a forgiveness of words, but there needs to be a real payment for crimes. And the gospel of God's grace is that we violated God's law. That we are all guilty. But God not only forgave us, but he took on flesh so that he can pay the price for our sin with his own blood. See, this death of Bathsheba and David's son is a foreshadow into Christ's sacrifice in the New Testament. God forgives us and he takes the consequences upon himself. This is atonement. See, when you talk to Muslims about the gospel, they say God is merciful. Allah is merciful. But they have no concept of atonement. They believe God forgives but there's no payment for the crimes that have already been committed. But the gospel, the true God, 
Jesus Christ not only forgives us out of his love and mercy, but he pays the price so that justice and righteousness are displayed on the cross as well. Colossians 2, verse 13 to 14 says, And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. We've got to practice what we preach. But we can't do that without grace. Failing to practice doesn't excuse you from preaching. We are called to speak the truth and love to each other as Christians. When we receive the grace of God in Christ, how are we supposed to live? Not to condemn one another, but to speak the truth in love to one another, not because we're perfect, but because we need to continually point others to Jesus who is perfect. I know many Christians who say, I'm not perfect, so I'm never going to correct another brother or sister in Christ. And that's false humility. Because you might be saving yourself an uncomfortable conversation, but you know what you're not doing? You're not obeying the word of Christ that tells us to speak truth in love to one another, to correct one another and point us to righteousness. We can't create our own little bubble of moral boundaries and convince ourselves that we're doing enough. We need to remember that the standard is Christ and obedience to Him. We are called to be holy for Christ who called us is holy and we are called to love one another in truth. You see, love without truth is just enabling sin. Love without truth is just enabling sin. But truth without love is condemnation. We are called to do both. And the only reason we can do both as Christians is because we've received the truth and love of Jesus Christ. Because the cross displays to us the grace of God and the truth of how grave and serious our sins were because of the perfect blood of Christ that was shed. How should we respond to hypocrisy? We should respond to hypocrisy with humility to God's word. And my prayer today is that the Word of God is speaking to you in your heart. That you will be convicted of your own sin. That the Lord may be removing the log out of your own eye. That you would see the speck in your brother or your sister's eye and realize, I need to address that, but I need to address it with grace. And I need to address it after I address my own sin. See, the Bible doesn't say, don't tell your brother. Jesus says, after you remove your law, then you can help your brother remove their speck from their eye. You see, this is what makes church work, is when we're willing to humble ourselves to the Word of God and speak the truth in love to one another. We have a responsibility for this because we carry the name of Jesus. I talk about how nominal Christians are hypocrites just as much as fanatic Christians are hypocrites at times. See, nominal Christians, they bear the name of Jesus, but they don't live it out. Fanatic Christians, they bear the name of Jesus, but they only follow the things that they want to follow. Both are hypocrites. Let us be true Christians, true children of God, true children of grace by examining ourselves Remembering the cross, letting the word of God be the mirror that exposes who we are, and let's pursue the love of Christ. You see, we shouldn't be correcting each other or judging each one another unless we're pursuing the love of Christ. Because if we don't have the love of Christ filling our hearts, what's going to come out is not going to be of Christ to one another. This is how we glorify Jesus. It's not just what we do or how much charitable deeds we do or how good our music is. Jesus himself said, by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. How we love each other as Christians matters just as much, if not more,
than how we love the rest of the world. Why? Because this is God's family. And when we tell people about Jesus, it's an invitation into God's family. We need to become the kind of family that people long for and need. That's how we glorify Jesus. So let's respond to hypocrisy with humility to God's word, starting with ourself. Let's examine ourselves. Always remember the cross. Let the word of God discern and speak to our hearts and pursue the love of Christ in all we think, all we say, and all we do towards one another and to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, without it, um, God, we'd be so lost and we'd be just stuck in our blindness. But through the gift of your Holy Spirit and through your word, Lord, you reveal, you expose the things in our hearts that don't belong. And Lord, you lead us in your grace to repentance. So God, I pray that if you've been convicting any of our hearts here today of our own hypocrisy, of our own sins, of the logs that are in our eyes, Lord, I pray that we would lay those things before you, that we would confess how we fall short of your glory. Lord, if we are the nominal Christian or the fanatical one, Lord, we aren't here for just self-improvement. Lord, we are here to pursue your holiness, to make your name great and your name known. God, would you fill us with the love of Christ, that we would love you and love one another as Christ has loved us, humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, to even die on a cross. Lord, with this love, would you empower us to be free from the cycle of hypocrisy and to be able to display your glory as the family of God. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your discipline over us because it means you love us. Thank you that you love us and that you are a good father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.